So let's welcome back Pastor Jim Baker as he comes to minister to us. Love you, brother. Man, that was encouraging just hearing all that. So good. You guys are salt of the earth people. All right. Well, hey, before we get started, I want to introduce my bride, my queen, the always the prettiest girl in the room, my constant uh, encourager, and uh, the visible sign of God's goodness in my life. So, Mary, why don't you stand up to wave to everybody? Isn't she lovely? Isn't she? Yep. So, thanks, babe. 29 years will be 30 years this year, so, so thankful. And so, um, hey, uh, a couple of quick products. This is a book called um, How Heaven Invades Your Finances. It is the best book on finances that I've ever written. <clears throat> the only one. Book two is coming out in April. And so, um, actually, it's based on, I did, a, uh, I did an 18-part series on finances in our church. I found out that was the most offensive thing a pastor named Jim Baker could do. And um, <laughs> at, at, as a result of this, within 12 months of, uh, of the finance series, about 50% of our church got out of debt. Um, completely out of debt, most of them including paying off their houses. Like, how on earth can that happen? Well, it's third John too. You prosper as your soul prospers. Prosperity starts on the inside. Prosperity starts with who you have, not what you have. So it's not about a bunch of gimmicks and blowing a shofar over your checkbook or marching around, you know, your bank statements and having the walls of debt fall down. It's not about these gimmicks. It's about tapping into the reality of who God is. And so um, I'll, I'll just give these away as a, as a package. This is the series. This has got probably about, you know, half the stuff in there. There's... Um, I don't know how to do this yet, Matt. Give it to someone who looks like they're a false prophet. So no, so, no, no. So there's one thing that, um, it's terrible. Every person who has made a difference for the Lord and, and, uh, and, and changed, the, uh, changed the planet, changed the city, whatever, it changed their family, they had a one thing in common, they had a lifestyle of encounters with the Lord. One encounter with the Lord can actually change everything. And so some people feel like they're encounter impaired or they just have a hard time receiving. And so my wife uh, is really gifted at helping people step into encounters with the Lord. So this is a book that teaches you into encounters. But at the end of each section, there's a QR code or a website where she actually walks you through having an encounter with the Lord. And she uh, takes you through different Bible passages. It's a book called God's Glory and Display. And so I love to give this away. Someone who just really wants more of the Lord. So... If you don't want more of the Lord, then just, you know, forget it, so. Oh, we got a series on healing out there. I did uh, the 26 healing miracles of Jesus. And so uh, I was re reading Andrew's book on the power of imagination. And he was talking about how uh, uh, with the dead raisings, and he would go through those stories and imagine those stories. And so I, I had just finished a series on healing in our church, and it didn't seem like much had shifted. And I felt like the Lord's like, I was reading that uh, Power of Imagination. So I took those 26 stories and really tried to paint a picture in our minds and learn healing the same way the disciples learned healing, was by looking over the shoulder of Jesus. And so um, I don't have that in my hand. I don't know why I'm talking about it, but it's out there at the, at the desk. This is uh, the Terms of the Blood Covenant. And so this is a um, series that I, I did at our church. I, I did part of it today. And this is really, it will just give you your assurance for how we are standing before God. How can we have confidence before the Lord? Uh, what's available to us? And so um, it's, a, it's on a jump drive there. So uh, give that to someone who looks like they have the Jezebel spirit. So there we go. <laughs> All right, you guys ready? All right, we're going to shift gears here. Or if it's a male, it's the Jezebel spirit. So yeah, there we go. Terrible. So I, I want to, here's what I want to do. I want to I shift gears a little bit. I feel like I'm supposed to put swords and spears in the hands of champions. I feel like I'm supposed to equip, uh, equip you today and lead you into an encounter with the voice of God. And so uh, you guys ready for that? One word from God can change anything. I, whether it's a word about your business, your family, your finances, your health, one word. I don't know about you, but when I have a word from the Lord, I can stand in just about any circumstance. When I don't have a word from God, I think it's really difficult. And so I remember there was a time I was, uh, I was, man, I was just reading books and researching and listening to all these sermons and just trying to get words for different areas of my life. And I was doing all those things, but I hadn't actually asked God himself. This was as a pastor. It's embarrassing. I'm not proud of it. But I'm, I'm like, I'm just looking for all wisdom in all the wrong places, so to speak, right? And I remember I was just sitting before the Lord. I finally got quiet for long enough. And the Lord's like, why don't you ask me? I was like, oh my, like, oh my word, what am I doing here? And so literally in two minutes, the Lord gave me a word for my wife, 
for Joshua, Wesley, Evan, my three boys, for the church and for the business, all in two minutes. I had a strategy, I knew what to do. It was brilliant beyond anything I could do. One word from the Lord. And so, I, so if that doesn't help anybody else, just slow down and ask, there, there, there's, there's something to try. But in any relationship, the strength of that relationship is this communication, right? And here's the good news. God wants to have a dialogue with you, not just a monologue where you're talking to him. Uh, the, the great theologian, Lily Tomlin, you guys remember her? She said, why is it that when we uh, talk to God, it's called prayer, but when he talks to us, it's called schizophrenia, <laughs> right? And here's what, but here's what the Bible says. In John 10, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Here's the thing. We hear his voice, but we don't always recognize it. God's talking to us in lots of different ways and sometimes we think it's just me. See, I used to think I was a human being having a spiritual experience. So when I thought I heard something from God, I said, oh, that was probably just me. Until I realized I'm a spiritual being having a human experience and now when I hear something, I say, you know what, that was probably God. Oh, Jim, how could you do that? You know, this is just little old me. Well, let's look at how just little old you is. Little old you is someone who's been united to Christ. You've been united to the Holy Spirit. Your spirit and his spirit are one spirit. You have the mind of Christ. If you want to hear God, have some thoughts. He literally said, his thoughts towards you outnumber the sands of the seashore and they're all to prosper you and not to harm you. God, he knew you before eternity. He's been building up things. His name is the word of God. He's got lots to say. And so what if it was way easier? So here's what I want to do today. How many of you guys recognize there's a mystical side to God? It's not just this you know, intellectual American Christianity, we got this figured out, we got our theology, neat and tidy boxes, like God, he doesn't really care about your boxes, okay? Now, none of us wants to be flaky. We're gonna talk about a mystical side of God, we're gonna use the Bible, it's gonna be great. You guys okay? There is a mystical side to God and none of us wants to be flaky. I remember I was sitting in a church service, I was on staff at a church in North Carolina and um, this guy comes up to me and he's shaking and he says, listen, I need to talk to you. And I'm like, okay, you know, I was on, the st- on staff of the church. He takes me out in the hallway and he says, uh, the Lord is, uh, he's told me uh, the identity of the two witnesses of Revelation. I thought, oh my goodness, okay. I'm, and so he, he was one of them, of course. I knew, the, I knew what the other shoe was gonna drop, that I was the other witness of the book of Revelation. And he's sweating as he's telling me this. And I said, I just wanna honor your courage, but I don't believe it. You know, I believe that the two witnesses are a picture of the church. They're called lampstands. Lampstands were there. I, you know, I just try to bless them in a good way, but none of us wants to be that guy. Giving those weird words, you know, and everyone kind of avoids you like the weird uncle of the family reunion. Nobody wants that, okay? But there's no one that you and I respect in the Lord who doesn't hear from God. And here's the thing. You're already hearing from God. What I want to do is help you recognize it a little more closely, okay? So um, I, I want to talk to you about this. When you hear from the Lord, a lot of times, when, um, here, here's the thing, God doesn't speak English, he speaks spirit. Okay, God does not speak English, he speaks spirit. He speaks the language of signs, symbols, dreams, visions, riddles, dark sayings. Okay, and so sometimes it's a little mysterious. So sometimes, I want to I just, there's no other good place to put this, so I'm just going to put it here. I want you to think of you having a revelation, you having to interpret that revelation, and then praying about how do I apply it. A lot of people have to do is they'll get a revelation and then out of their mind, they'll begin to think, well, I think this symbol means this and this means this. You need the Holy Spirit for all three parts here, okay? So let me give you an illustration, okay? I want everybody to close your eyes and take out your wallets. No, we're not gonna do that. I'm just kidding. Yeah, sorry, it's, it's terrible. Here's what I want you to do. Some of you didn't like that at all. All right, so um, right, seriously, close your eyes and I want you to imagine a, a bridge on fire, a picture of a bridge on fire. You guys see that? Okay, now open your eyes. Imagine that you're, uh, you're praying for somebody, you're just going along, and you get that, um, that image in your mind, in your mind's eye, in your imagination, right? Your sanctified imagination becomes the canvas that the Holy Spirit can paint on. Okay, I want you guys to get that. Like, like when the Lord's giving you pictures like that, okay, the, your mind becomes this canvas that he can paint on. This is how he can communicate to you when you're, when you're offering yourself up to the Lord. So imagine that, that burning bridge, that's the revelation. What does it mean? What does it mean? A lot of people would just kind of just jump into what it means. I just want to give you some different some ideas of interpretation. It could be the Lord saying, you need to burn the bridges with your past. God has freed you from that stuff. That could be a really good interpretation. Another one could be warning, you're burning bridges in your relationship. Stop it. Another one could be, you are a bridge builder and the fire of God is on you to continue to do so. Run, son. I mean, you know, those are three completely different interpretations, but it's the same revelation. 
See, we get the revelation, we need God for the interpretation. I love when Daniel's getting ready to interpret a dream for the king, and he says, the interpretation belongs to the Lord, right? And then there's the application. What do I do with this whole thing? We had a, um, a prophet come to our church, and um, I put it in quotes because the, the rest of the story, I believe that there's prophets. Uh, he came to our, our, our church, and he told a 12-year-old boy, your teenage years are going to be hell, That's what he told the kid. For the next six years, the kid had this foreboding spirit, expecting bad things to happen to them. He became uh, fearful, kept expecting bad things to happen, was suicidal. So we didn't know know about this. With the family, uh, they were kind of visiting the church. They didn't really go there. So six years later, we come across uh, this family, and they tell us what happened. We're like, we're so sorry. We did not know all this. We ministered them. The kid got free. Um, That's not a really good application. I don't know what his revelation was. I don't know what the interpretation that this prophet had, but that was a terrible application. Okay, what if the application would might have looked something like this? The prophet tells his parents, I see that your son is being prepared for greatness. He will have some tests that he is fully prepared for to win during his teenage years, and when he comes through, he will be a mighty warrior. Well, that would have been a way better application of those type of things. Okay? So when you're getting a word from the Lord, there's a revelation, the picture, there's the interpretation, what does it mean, application, and what do I do with it? We need the Holy Spirit for all three parts. Okay? Are we doing good? Okay, so when does God speak to us? Constantly. Okay, he's the word of God. He's like, every time you hear from God, you're having an encounter with Jesus, okay? So um, how does God speak to us? Uh, Turn to me to Jeremiah chapter one. We're gonna look at verses 11 and 12. Jeremiah chapter one, verse 11 and 12. I want you to show you just kind of a weird one. You guys good so far? The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see a branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I'm watching to see my word is, that my word is fulfilled. Well, that's kind of an odd one. God's like, well, imagine, like, God's like, what's that? That's a keyboard. Exactly. That means I'm going to perform my word. Like, how are these two things connected? You see, like, 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 it's not like a logical thing. In Hebrew, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the word almond branch and the word ready rhyme. And so in God's mind, it's like he's kind of giving a little bit of a play on words. Remember, he, speak, he doesn't speak English. He speaks spirit. He speaks in words, symbols, pictures. I mean, uh, I think if someone came, uh, you know, come on the stage today and say, you know, hey, I've got a word from the Lord. Look at this keyboard. It's red. It means God's ready to perform a sign. I don't think a lot of us would be excited. I think a lot of us would be like, a red keyboard? Ready to perform a sign? I'm not really sure. Red? Ready? Like, I, like I'm not like super excited about that. Are you guys seeing this? But this is how God speaks to us. And we've got, we have to adjust to how he speaks. He's not going to adjust to how we speak, or how we expect him to speak, okay? We've all heard it said a picture is worth a thousand words, and God speaks in signs, symbols, uh, pictures. And so as we're getting ready to start this, um, I'm just going to give you a warning. If you're not willing to take what you hear and uh, and get get, uh, input from other people who see and hear clearly, your life might go poorly for you. I'm not talking about being some renegade and I can hear from God and nobody else can hear from God and you can't have any kind of input into your life. I'm not talking about being that guy, okay? And uh, are, you guys, are we all right with this? All right, I feel like, yeah, all right, all right. Okay, good, good, good. Um, the hungry heart is the heart that's gonna hear the best. The hungry heart is the heart that's gonna hear the, hear the best. Um, Proverbs says this, the one who is full loathes honey But the one who is hungry, even the bitter thing tastes sweet. Wasn't that interesting? See, the hungry heart's going to take it however God wants to say it. Some people might go, well, God speaks to me in dreams. Well, what if he stops speaking to you in dreams? Are you hungry enough to see if he's speaking to you another way? Okay. I remember when my wife and I were first married, we got this revelation that if you use your credit cards, you can buy things you can't afford. It's this incredible revelation. It extended our purchasing power beyond our bank account. It was incredible. We, we, We ran with this revelation. And so um, we had this really like kind of like old junky furniture and we went and we bought this new furniture and literally the store was called Hank's Fine Furniture. It was, it was, it was not fine. And so Hank's Fine Furniture, I remember uh, later on somehow it got infested with mice and um, yeah, and uh, we donated it to the, uh, the fire department so they could practice like putting out fires and they're like, Jim, we have never seen furniture go up in smoke so fastly. That was the cheapest furniture. Anyway, so we put the uh, we, we, uh, put the um, the furniture on it. And so we're like, hey, who are we going to give this furniture to? And I had this friend in uh, the seminary, uh, what was his name? Kenny and Sabrina, Kenny and Sabrina. They had no furniture. They were married like us and broke. We, you know, we were broke too. And so, except we had, you know, the revelation of the credit cards. 
And so like literally their apartment, they had a bed and that's it. Like they're eating picnic style every single, every meal. Like that's all they had was a bed, like, like, not a, just like a mattress on a floor, no bed frame. And so I'm like, hey, Kenny, you know, um, and I've been to your place and hey, you know, Mary and I got this blessing of the Lord with this, you know, MasterCard and it's, it's incredible. And so we like to like give you guys some furniture and uh, here's what he says to me. Remember, they're eating on the floor, okay? He says, you know what? I need to come over and make sure that, it, that the furniture fits our style. <laughs> I'm like, your style, like the apocalypse, like... Like you've, been, like you've been robbed blind, like, like the minimal of minimal, like what your style, they came over and they rejected our furniture. <laughs> the one who is full loathes honey, but to the one who is hungry, even the bitter thing tastes sweet. Listen guys, when you're hungry, you're not going to be picky about how God speaks. It's the hungry heart that hears best, okay? And so... Uh, our, our greatest treasure is to host the Holy Spirit, to, uh, to seek him, to follow him, to listen to him. I don't know about you, I want you to get this picture in your mind. I want to be like a leaf on a tree responding to his slightest breeze. Well, I want to position my heart that way. We find, uh, Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. We find life in his words. And so... Jesus tells this parable about four soils and there's one seed. The seed is the word of God. The, uh, the soils are different heart conditions. They have different kinds of responses. And he talks about how the, there's a, a soil that the good soil produces 30, 60, even 100 fold response. You guys remember this story? And so I'm reading this and I'm, and I'm, I'm like, God, I want to be the 100 fold, 100 fold soil. I don't know about you guys. When you read that, you're, I'm like, I, I mean, 30 is incredible, but I want the 100 fold. And I remember the Lord said, keep reading. I'm like, keep reading. I don't know if you guys know, the next parable actually interprets the 30, 60, 100. So let's read it in uh, Mark 4, 21. Mark 4, 21, and Jesus said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to him, pay attention to what you hear. Here's the key. The measure that you use, it will be measured to you and still more will be added. For the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. You guys ready for this? The value that you place on God speaking is the measure that you will hear. I'm going to say it again. The value that you place on God speaking is the measure that you will hear. He says, pay attention to what you hear. Verse 24. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Proverbs 25.2 says, um, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of man to search it out. That's the way that it's supposed to be, is God speaks to us in a language that requires hunger and thirst. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of man to search it out. Listen, God hides things for you. He doesn't hide them from you. Okay? So my friends, uh, they adopted this little boy named Samuel, and he didn't quite understand the game of hide and go seek. Okay? So he would do this. He would go hide behind the couch, and he'd say, I'm over here. Come and find me. Okay? That's how God plays hide and seek. He's not hiding from you. He's hiding for you. There's something in this seeking that enables you to become the kind of person who can carry the weight of the answer. All right. I'm trying to say something here. Remember uh, Easter egg hunting? So there's no parent that's going in the backyard, digging up a, a six-foot hole, putting the eggs under there, burying it up, putting back the side, and they're like, let's see the kids find this. <laughs> Actually, there might be some parents like that, but they're, they're, they're not great parents. I had a friend who's, uh, whose dad made them open presents Christmas evening, made them wait all day just to torture them, so he might do that. But most parents are like, they're like hiding it, you know, like, uh, like you know, right in front, right, right next to like the, the flower jar in the counter or like on top of a pillow on the couch, right? You're hiding things for your kids, not from your kids. This is how God says the kingdom is. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search it out. It's time for us as royal sons and daughters to rise up and begin to search out these things that God has for us. All right. So do you want to hear God more? He's saying, pay attention, hunger for his voice, value it, treasure it, write these things down, pursue these things. Have you ever been around one of those people who find spiritual meaning in everything? I married one. And so I'll be honest, I used to kind of make fun of her a little bit. And, um, and so like to her, a digital clock was not 
a way to tell time. It was a portal for heaven to speak to her. She's like, did you see it's 1111? I'm like, yeah, it probably happened twice today, you know, like. <laughs> but she's like, yeah, but I saw it t- like four days in a row. It's 1111. I'm like, okay, like, like, I, I don't understand. I don't understand what you're talking about here, right? And so um, uh, we had a friend who said, um, not everything means something, but some things mean more than you think. And as I begin to find out that those weird people who begin to find God all over the place, God sure seemed to be speaking to them. They had a lot more fruit than me sitting there with my arms crossed making fun of them. And as I began to despise those things and mock those things, it was like I heard less. And when I repented and said, you know what, God, I see in the Bible, we're going to go through a bunch of the ways that God speaks. And I want you, I would just want us to open ourselves up and say, God, you can speak in a whole bunch of different ways. And I think a lot of you are going to connect some dots and go, you know what? I'm hearing God's voice. I didn't recognize it. He's already been speaking to me that way. Prophetic ministry, that is a different kind of ministry. Have you ever been around like the prophet? I'm not talking about like this, just the spooky prophet eyes, but just prophetic people in general. They can be a little bit different. Um, do you guys remember the original Batman movie with uh, uh, Adam West and Burt Ward? Remember that? Um, the original, I remember uh, Robin, he would say things like, holy hole in a donut, Batman. Remember that? <laughs> My favorite one that he said was, holy contribution to the delinquency of minors, Batman. I'm like, what? <laughs> that was literally one of them, the ones that he said. So in the original Batman movie, you remember this. And so there, there, uh, there's something going on over this sea and they send Batman and the Batcopter on there. And Batman goes down the, uh, the little bat ladder thing. And all of a sudden, you remember this shark grabs hold of his leg. You guys remember this? And it was this really funny looking rubber shark. And Batman's trying to punch the shark off him and it won't do it. He just says, Robin, get me the shark repellent. And so they go up to the, um, they go up to the bat copter and they're panning over and it says manta ray repellent. Remember this one? I, th- I think I wrote it down. Uh, manta ray repellent. I did not write it down. Oh, barracuda repellent, whale repellent, then there's the shark repellent, thank goodness. You, know, you don't want to mix up the manta ray with the shark repellent. So Robin gets it, and Robin was an acrobat, if you remember, and he takes it and he kind of hooks his legs down, he puts the back copter on autopilot, hands it to Batman. Batman sprays the shark in the face with the shark repellent, and he falls off, and as he falls off, the shark explodes. Revelation. Shark exploding was the revelation. And the next scene, you have Chief O'Hara, Commissioner Gordon, Batman, and Robin are now going to interpret this revelation. So as they begin to talk, they're saying, they're trying to figure this out. And, um, and uh, Commissioner Gordon says, it's quite puzzling how this happened. <gasps> puzzling. Could it be the Riddler? One of Batman's arch enemies. And Batman says, the, uh, the shark was pulling my leg. The Joker. <laughs> and then um, Chief O'Hara says, it was quite, uh, no, what was it? It was... Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was quite fishy. Could it be the penguin? My favorite one, though. Robin says, it happened at C. C is for Catwoman. S-E-A. Happened to S-E-A. But C is for Catwoman. I'm like, this is the prophetic ministry I'm watching happen right in front of me, right here. Revelation, exploding shark. Interpretation, Robin actually gets, the, um, he gets the, uh, the interpretation. Holy nightmare, Batman. Could it be, he says, Robin, all four of them? And they realize it's all four of Batman's greatest enemies teaming up against him. And then the application, what are they going to do to fight off these bad guys? Welcome to the prophetic ministry, people. <laughs> what were they doing? Not everything means something, but some things mean more than they think, and they're looking for the clues. They're following it. They're taking their, uh, their, the matter was concealed, and now they're searching it out. Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it'll be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. Okay, so um, how does God speak? How does God speak? So um, have you guys have heard of the prophet named Bobby Connor? Yeah, so we love Bobby. Bobby's researching a book. He was helping Jack Deere write a book called um, something about God speaking. Um, Surprised by the voice of God. Fabulous book. So Bobby's kind of researching. He was going to help Jack Deere. And so he's researching ways that God speaks. And all of a sudden, you know, prophets, a lot of times they have these experiences with God that are pretty extraordinary. And so he says he's at his office and he kind of hears something in the background. He looks and he says there's this like a fuzzy curtain that appears. And all of a sudden the curtain opens and Jesus steps through the curtain. So he's kind of He's kind of dumbfounded and he's he's turned around in his chair and he says, uh, Jesus looks at him and points and says, tell Jack I can speak any way I want to. 
goes to climbing the curtain, swings his arm back around and says, I can speak any way I want to, gets in the curtains. Obviously, he didn't want Bobby to limit any way God could speak. So I'm, I'm going to ask you guys a question. How can God speak? Okay, so this is not meant to limit anything in the way God can speak. We're just going to simply look at some. Uh, some are a little bit more um, maybe common to us. Some might be a little bit more different, but I want to just uh, kind of open us up. So you guys ready? So let's just look at one way. Uh, just, let's just call it an awareness of his presence. Okay, just an awareness of his presence. Uh, we come into his presence. We're fellowshipping with the Lord. Uh, we're not really vocalizing anything. We're just kind of sharing spirit to spirit. Like I'm just enjoying the Lord. Maybe I feel a peace I wouldn't be able to tell you when I came out of that time anything that the Lord had spoken, but it felt like it had been ministered to. Okay, how many of you guys have had an experience like that? Okay, that, that counts, all right? Um, another one uh, might be the still small voice. That would require a whole message on that. I know Andrew's got a great series on hearing God's voice, and uh, a lot of Christians have learned the still small voice. Maybe you've heard it called a prompting. Uh, maybe you've heard it called a leading. Uh, Matthew 4.1, if we could uh, pull that up there because I don't have it in my notes. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. And then Jesus was led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay, and so uh, there's an, maybe you've had an experience where there's this unction, there's this leading, there's this prompting that you're supposed to go and do something. Okay, so there's those leadings, there's those promptings. Sometimes it gets even stronger where it's like a check in your spirit. Like there's this check, like I'm, I'm, I, I can't go here, you know. Uh, but maybe you've heard those stories of people who are like they were supposed to get on a plane and they didn't get on a plane because they felt like God told them not to and the plane ends up crashing. And so um, Acts chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. Acts chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Verse 7. And when they had come up to um, Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. You see that the Holy Spirit forbid them, did not allow them. That's another form of, this, of, of, of these leadings, of these promptings, of just being, uh, that, that, I'll just call it being um, forbidden or like that check in the Spirit. How many of you guys remember that? You, you, maybe you're going to go make a purchase. You were going to maybe go into business with somebody, but you've had a check in your spirit. We just weren't supposed to do this, okay? And there's just that absence of peace, okay? We'll just call that a, another level there. Another way God speaks to us through is the Scriptures, I want to just say this, the scriptures are the basis for all of our hearing from God, <clears throat> okay? And so the more grounded you are in the, in the, in the word of God and the ways of God, <clears throat> I think the better you are to be able to recognize his voice. And so I remember we had a, a relative and uh, he was getting a divorce. And um, I remember my dad went up to him and was like, uh, hey, um, you know, what, what am I hearing about this? And he's like, oh, um, he's like, uh, God wants me, God says it's okay for me to get divorced because God wants me happy. And I'm not happy in my marriage. And so God says, it's okay for me to get a divorce, okay? So how do we evaluate that statement? Well, we could evaluate a scripture. I remember my dad, my, <laughs> my, dad, my dad put his hand under his armpit and says, your armpits are sweaty because you're lying right now. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> he did. He's, and so, yeah, anyway. Anything that you're hearing from God has to line up with the ways, ways of God or the word of God. <clears throat> Look at 2 Peter chapter 1. Verses 19 through 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. This is interesting. It says that we actually, okay, let's read what it says. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. What's more fully confirmed than a prophetic word? To which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning, morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, interpretation I'm sorry, I switched on, I'm sorry. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is interesting that you have this prophetic word, but you have this more sure word, which was the word that was written down, the scriptures. And so we want to, that, that is, that is the, the, the level of hearing that's the baseline for everything else. Another way God speaks to us through is our desires. Our sanctified desires can actually reveal the will of God. Listen to Mark eleven twenty four. 24. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. <clears throat> Whatsoever things you desire when you pray. This is not a license to pursue every desire, but your desires are literally shaped in the presence of God. As you're in prayer, as you're in God's presence, he begins to shape your desires and you can actually begin to trust the things that you're desiring when you're in prayer. I would encourage you with this too. As you're praying, sometimes our minds begin to wander I'm not saying every time it wanders, but a lot of times I'll just keep a pen and a paper there and I'm just kind of enjoying the Lord and I'll have a thought. 
A lot of times those drifting thoughts are actually God leading me. I'll begin to write those things down and I'll see later on, oh, I was supposed to call that person. Oh, I actually need to follow up on this. So you're actually your desires can get shaped in person. How many of you feel like you've been led by your desires that have been shaped? Awesome. Um, so yeah, if, you, if your mind wanders to something while you're praying, pay attention, okay? Um, another one, let's just call it an open vision, okay? This is almost like a movie screen. Like your eyes are open and you're physically seeing something on the screen. So I haven't had a lot of these. I remember when we first started pastoring the church, I was feeling really intimidated because the church seemed super prof- prophetic and I felt very pathetic, right? And so it's like the, the pathetic ministry. And so, um, and so I, I drink a lot of water during the day and so I'm walking down the hallway. This is like in reality, not in like in a, a prophetic dream. And so I'm, I'm, in, I'm walking down and the hallway was dark. We just had the lights off. And so when I got to the restroom, all of a sudden I had this open vision. And in this open vision, I see myself, I'm in, the ba- I'm in the back of the hallway, and these hands come down and put these golden glasses on me. And then when I have the golden glasses on, I can see everything bright. And in the dream, I'm walking, I can see everything clearly. And when I got to where my body was, actually, it lifted. Now, you would think if you had an open vision, you would know it. Somehow, I, my spiritual senses were dulled. I went, hmm, that was weird. And so then, um, <laughs> totally missed an open vision. And so as a pastor, and so, um, so I'm, you know, a couple hours later, I'm drinking more water, and so the same thing happens. I'm walking down the hallway, and it's dark, get to the bathroom, boom, open vision. Pull back to the beginning, it's dark, golden glasses, can see everything, get to my body. And so I thought, huh, I wonder if that means something. And so, <clears throat> I know, it's so sad. And so, um, so I get back to my office, and uh, I felt like the Lord's like, read Mark chapter four. And so I was reading Mark chapter four, where it talks about how the farmer doesn't know uh, how this whole thing happens. He plants a seed, he goes to bed, and the first there's the grain, the, st- the stalk, the head of wheat, then the sickle. And I felt like the Lord said, the pressure's off, you can't make it happen. I was like, man. So remember, there was, the, there was this revelation, but then I had to get the interpretation for what it meant. The guy was saying, listen, uh, he's saying, he's saying um, he said, I'm gonna give you these glasses, and as long as you follow me, you'll see everything clearly. The pressure's off, you can't make it happen. Okay, so those are those, those outer visions there. So how many of you guys have had this where you've seen something with your eyes open? Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna, I'll call this next one um, an inner vision or maybe your spiritual eyes or your uh, sanctified imagination. See, when you were born again, your old man died and you came alive to have new spiritual senses. Okay, you've got new spiritual eyes, spiritual ears. You have spiritual taste buds that can taste and see the Lord now. You have a stomach that hungers for the, for the Lord. So let's look at this new faculty of sight, Ephesians 1.17. May God give you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation and the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know, and it says a bunch of things. Um, that you, you guys see you have eyes in your heart. You're able to perceive spiritual truth the way your eyes are able to take in physical information. You have these spiritual eyes that are able to take in spiritual information. Acts 26, 18, Paul's commission was to open their eyes so that they might be turned from darkness to light. Okay, so the world doesn't have this sight, but believers have this ability to see. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes again for a moment. And I want you to imagine your favorite vacation place or your place you like to take a vacation, okay? All right, open your eyes. Okay, now with your eyes open, I want you to picture that place that you had with your eyes closed, like a snapshot or a picture, or like a little movie in your brain. Are you guys able to do that? That is how it's going to feel to you when God speaks to you through your, this inner vision, your imagination. Guys, it's not more powerful to have one of these, however God wants to speak to you, we'll take all of them, okay? But I bet you there's a lot of times you guys have had an inner vision. You've had something come to your mind, a name, something you were supposed to do. I remember I was at this restaurant um, with a bunch of just really like crazy Jesus people. And uh, we were talking and somehow there's, people were talking about shoulders and like, man, it was like, it was like five people had something wrong with their shoulder. I said, this is so crazy. I've had, uh, I prayed for three shoulders this week. They all got healed. I'm like, let's just, let's just go for it here in the restaurant. And so I come up to this person and as I'm getting ready to pray, my eyes are open and I see in my mind, uh, I see myself reaching around this person's back and drawing three stripes on their shoulder. I thought, oh man. So I've learned that, um, the faster I obey, usually the more powers are released rather than trying to figure it out with my head. And so I said, hey, can I try something different? And she's like, sure. And I just reached around and I didn't say out loud. I just went one, two, three. And I said, um, check it out. And she's like, is that it? I said, I don't know. And so, um, <laughs> and so uh, she raises her hand. All of a sudden she bursts into tears. I said, what's going on? She said, 25 years ago, I was thrown off a horse and I shattered my shoulder so bad they had to remove three muscles. She says, I physically don't have the muscles to be able to raise my hand. I'm thinking, I am so glad I did not know that. 
Like, I, I don't have the faith for three muscles to draw in there, and God knew that. But he needed someone with authority on earth to act in faith in response to his voice. Three muscles grew back in there. All, okay, what, what if it's that easy? Yeah, you, you can clap for God on that one. Yeah, he, he, he just had to find a donkey that was willing to speak on that one, right? How many of you guys have had this before? You guys, you had that inner vision, the, the, the spiritual imagination? All right. I'll talk about spiritual ears or intuition, okay? Uh, it's intuition that's coming from the Holy Spirit. It's the source of it. So let me, let me describe it to you. John 8, 43. Why do you not understand what I am saying? It's because you cannot hear my word. He who is of God hears the words of God. So he says you can hear the sound with your ears, but there's this inside ears that you have to hear with. Um, Revelation chapter two, verse seven, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the spirit is saying. So intuition is coming to a conclusion without any natural sequence to get there. So reasoning would say one, two, three, four, five, six. Intuition goes six. I remember my wife, oftentimes we would be in a situation and she would just suddenly know. And I'm like, babe, like you can't, you can't know that like that. Like that doesn't make any sense. Right, and so I just kind of despised her for having this revelation because it didn't make sense to my human brain. I've learned to trust that uh, more and more. How many of you guys remember um, uh, the, the spiritual cartoon Phineas and Ferb? You guys remember this? So Phineas and Ferb was a great cartoon on, on, on Disney Channel, and Phineas and Ferb were these two young boys, and they would uh, often, you know, they'd be doing something, and they would have this revelation, oh, that's what we're gonna do today, right? And they would have this whole adventure. That's the spiritual intuition. It's, it's, all of a sudden, it's, oh, I understand it now. I didn't get there by reason. I didn't get there by logic. I didn't, I didn't put all the pieces together. I just, boom. I, I, I just all of a sudden knew it. Nehemiah chapter seven, verse five. So God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. It wasn't an audible voice that Nehemiah heard. There was this inside voice where all of a sudden he knew in his heart, I know what I'm gonna do today. I know what I'm supposed to do, okay? When you have God speak to you, are we okay? Are we guys Okay. When, when God speaks to you like this, it's going to have a freshness to it, okay? It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to almost have this come out of the blue. I'm just going to add this part to it. I don't know why it works this way. Maybe it works like this for you. I seem to hear God more when my hands are engaged in something that doesn't require a lot of brain work. So like I'm mowing the grass or I'm washing the dishes or drying the dishes. There's something about just engaging your hands in something that isn't real technical that um, you just, I don't know what it is. It just kind of opens me up to hear God more. And so maybe you guys have had that experience too, but it'll have this freshness to it. It'll almost just be out of the blue, right? It'll be better, it'll, it'll usually be better than anything you could have thought up and will often require faith. You know, a lot of times God's not like, hey, yay that, I, yay that I say to thee, tie your other shoe. Oh yes, God, that's so good. Like, like it's usually things that are gonna require some faith, okay? <clears throat> so here's what I wanna do. I wanna help you uh, just, just tap into probably what you're already hearing. Close your eyes again. And when I count to three, I want you to say your first, middle, and last name in your mind, not out loud. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Open your eyes. When God speaks to you, it's often, it's gonna sound like that. It's going to sound like your voice. Why? Because your spirit and his spirit are one spirit. A lot of people are waiting for God to come with this shaky King James English, you know, I'm your father. Oh, yes, I've been waiting for this. You're going to be waiting a long time if you're waiting for James Earl Jones, Darth Vader voice to come in and penetrate your psyche, <clears throat> okay? Remember, you're a spiritual being having a human experience, so when you have a thought, you begin to think, that was probably God, and you're going to learn to filter those things out because not every single thought that comes in your brain is God, but uh, you begin to learn to filter these things out. Listen to Mark uh, chapter 2, verse 8. Jesus knew in his spirit what they were thinking. What's it talking about? It's talking this intuition, it didn't say he figured it out based on this. He read the situation. No, no, no. He just, boom. He, he just knew these things. Luke 5, 22. Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in his heart? And I got some good news for you. You and I hear from God the same way that Jesus heard from God. Jesus, uh, he, he got word pictures. You're like, Jim, how do you know that he, remember he, he had spiritual imagination like we talked about. Uh, Jim, how do you know that? Because he said, I only, uh, hear what I, I only say what I hear the father say. And when he taught, he taught in word pictures. The kingdom of God is like a, a, a pearl in a field. It's like a, it's like a wedding banquet. It's like he had these word pictures. Jesus heard in word pictures. And we see here that uh, he, um, Jesus knew in his heart what they were thinking. That spiritual intuition, that spiritual imagination. We get to hear from God the same way that Jesus get to hear, heard from God. 
Here's another one. I know these are rapid fire. I'm leading you somewhere. I'm going to lead you guys into an encounter with God's voice. You guys okay with that? Like, Jim, that sounds mystical. Well, you're claiming that the Trinity lives inside of you. Let's start there with mystical, okay? <laughs> God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit all said they're going to make their home in you, so let's, let's start there. <clears throat> another one, uh, coincidence. Uh, Bill Johnson said, coincidence is the language of the Spirit. I love that. Luke chapter 10, verse 31, it says, and by co- this is in the New American Standard. So if you got it in the New American Standard, if you're able to pull that one up. Luke 10, 31 in the New American Standard, and by coincidence, a priest was going down on the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. The word coincidence there is made up of two Greek words, and here's what it means. It's what occurs together by God's providential arrangement of circumstances. A coincidence, right? It's exa- yeah. Coincidence, it means it's a coincidence, right? It's exactly what it says. I love this. Coincidence is the language of the Spirit. So I remember um, when they had the Lakeland Revival going on in 2008. Our family, we really wanted to go there. But we were, as they say in the Greek, Maximus Brocus. Okay, actually, that was Latin, Maximus Brocus. We didn't have the money to do it. And so we're trying to figure out, like, how much would it take to go down there? They were going to do, like, an impartation service or something. We were, didn't really understand it, but we just wanted to go. So this was on, like, a Sunday. And we figured out it was going to cost $1,200 for us to be able to go down there, do this whole thing. And we would have to leave by Wednesday to get there. Okay, and so... Uh, Mary's like, hey, I just really believe the Lord wants us to do that. And I'm like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And so again, not proud, just reporting it, okay? And so, 2008. And so, um, so we pray on Sunday, and uh, so we need the money on Wednesday. So I go out to the mailbox on, on Wednesday. I get, the, I get the mail, open up the mail, and there's a $1,200 check there. I went, huh, that's pretty weird. And I put it on the check, and Mary's got tears in her eyes, and she's like, don't you remember we prayed? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, and so... $1,200, right? And so, um, so we made the trip down. There was 20, uh, 20 hours in the car, which if you do the conversion charts in the back of your Bible, 20 hours in the car with children is equal to 40, uh, 40 years in the desert, right? And so, <laughs> but there it was. It was like, here's this coincidence. We needed $1,200. We got the $1,200 check. We took that to be God's will. And so um, how many of you, you see, uh, uh, see numbers, like uh, recurring numbers all the time? Okay, this could be a coincidence. I remember uh, there, was a, there was a time where I kept seeing the numbers 1038 everywhere I went. I get off the phone, I look, it was 10 minutes and 38 seconds. I get a room in a hotel, it was, uh, it was room 1038. I look on the clock, it'd be 1038. I went to the uh, movie uh, Dark Knight Rises with Bane. Uh, remember that Batman movie? Okay, uh, Butch, how are we doing? There we go, yeah. And so you remember uh, the bad guy, uh, Talia and Bane, they're trying to take over Gotham and they're gonna blow it up with this bomb. And so they're, they're, they're chasing the bomb all around the city and the bomb is counting down. And so I'm, this is right in the height of God speaking to me at 1038. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, there's, a, there's a scene where it came and it stopped right on 10 minutes and 38 seconds of the bomb calming down. I wanted to stand up. God is speaking to me through Batman. <laughs> you're like, Jim, I think you're reading into stuff. Maybe I am. Not everything means something, but some things more than you think. And God began to reveal, Jim, this is your life verse, Acts 10, 38. How Jesus, it was, uh, Jesus of Nazareth anointed with power. He went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And so it was a coincidence to begin to see. I remember um, there's, there's a car called the Oldsmobile Alero. I don't want anyone to feel bad if they have an Oldsmobile Alero, but no one's excited about an Oldsmobile Alero. It's, it's, it's not like, I just began to see them everywhere. Like, I don't normally notice Oldsmobile Aleros. I just began to notice them everywhere. And I'm like, hold on, like, this, is, this is a coincidence. I'm seeing these cars everywhere. I went and looked up the meaning of Alero. You know what it is? It's a Nigerian name, and it means um, grace of the land and good things to come. I'm like, man, I, guess I keep getting these love notes from God. I remember one time I was sitting at the light. All of a sudden, the, the presence of God ru- like rushes in my car. I'm like having an encounter with the Lord sitting there at the stoplight. And I look next to me, it's an Oldsmobile Alero. Not everything means something, but some things mean more than you think. How are we doing? How many of you guys have had these uh, unusual coincidences? God speak to you through numbers type of thing? All right. How many of you think I'm weird and you can't wait for this to be over? Yeah. (laughs) Andrew, you'd be surprised how many hands just raised. So, (laughs) yeah, I appreciate the honesty. All right, there we go. Uh, Let's get another uh, one. Unusual circumstances. How many of you guys know sometimes things just are too strange to not be prophetic? You're like, this is just strange. So Moses, he's walking in a desert and there's a burning bush. It probably wasn't that unusual for a combustible bush in the middle of a desert. But what was unusual is this one was not, was not, uh, 
was not, was not being consumed, all right? And we all love the part where it says, and Moses turned aside, right? And so what happens is a lot of people, they just don't turn aside. They're, they're not paying attention to these things, all right? Um, another way God can speak to us is through nature. Uh, Romans chapter one, verse 20. I'm gonna be reading from the New Living Translation. Romans chapter one, verse 20. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made, and they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. Well, you can actually see God and have him speak to you through nature. Uh, Psalm 19, one through four in the New Living Translation. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. He even talks about trees would begin to cry out if, they didn't, if, there, if uh, people didn't praise him, right? And so some occurrences are too weird. So we had a real tragedy in our family happen um, in May 2009. My sister passed away and uh, we were supposed to, right during that time, we had, uh, this was like the first time we'd have been able to save up for a vacation. We're gonna pay for it in cash, it was gonna be great. And so we prepaid for this vacation and we weren't able to take the vacation because we had to stay with the family and all that type of stuff. And so it was just a really difficult time in our family and I'm like, man, we really, we need to go on a vacation. Like we need to do something to get away. And so we, we were going to have to do it on the cheap. <clears throat> so we went to this place in Florida. I'm not going to say the name of it. I'm just going to call it the Redneck Riviera, okay? <laughs> this place was something else, man. And so I'm just, just you know, I want you to know, I, I had partnered with something negative, like, like, like a negative spirit. So I am Mr. Krabby Pants is what my wife called me. And so... Um, in the spirit, she called to be that. And so, um, and so I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm just upset about everything. I'm ticked off that we lost our money. I'm ticked off that we're in the Redneck Riviera. And so um, I go down and it's senior week, not meaning senior citizens, meaning seniors in high school. And so they're hanging out the balconies, drinking bongs and beer and wearing basically nothing. And uh, so that's not helping Mr. Krabby Pants at all. And so I go down to the pool. People are eating chicken in the pool. Not at the pool, standing in the pool eating chicken. I'm like, you people are classless, you stupid hicks. I can't stand it. So I'm sitting there just judging them. And this guy gets out of the pool limping. And Mary's like, are you going to go pray for him? I'm like, oh my word. <laughs> like, you got to be kidding me. So we go to this place called Shell Island, which I renamed Hell Island because it had no shade. And in case you don't know, I'm not like Mr. Outdoors. You know, I got like sunburn from my Kindle reader, you know. And so... <laughs> So typically, whatever year it is, that's the number of sunblock I wear. So this year, I'll be wearing 2024 sunblock, right? <laughs> and so, um, so we go to Hell Island, and uh, I thought I had put on some lotion, like, you know, like the mime makeup, basically, you know? And so I'm putting on this lotion, but it was, uh, it was the stuff you're supposed to do for, like, the aftercare for the sunburn. I put on the wrong stuff. So it's a sun accelerant. And so here we're on Hell Island and I'm like, man, I just, I'm not, I'm not feeling good. And as we're walking off Hell Island, I had blisters that had formed all across my neck. My feet were no longer recognizable as feet. They looked like lobster claws. And so I, I, can't, wear, I can't even wear shoes in the car. I'm like, I'm all swollen up. So for three days, I'm crabbing at everybody and, you know, I'm trying to, yeah, it just there's a whole story there. And so the kids are like, dad, we know you're sunburned, but you promised to take us to the water park. I'm like, oh my word. And Mary's like, babe, you promised the kids, maybe you can just kind of you know, wear some clothes to cover it up. And I'm like, fine, fine, we'll go to the stupid water park, you know? So we get to the water park, I'm like, I forgot a hat and sunglasses. And Mary's like, you can wear mine. <clears throat> so already, <clears throat> I have a polo shirt on with a button to the top with a collar up to protect my neck. Now I've got this giant sun hat on <clears throat> and those sunglasses that are like, Marilyn Monroe, right? <clears throat> so now I look like a gay French king going to like a pool or something like this. And so I am extra crabby, extra crabby at this. And so um, Mary goes, hey, just pretend you own a yacht. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's real funny, real funny, right? And so, so going to the stupid water park, I got socks up to my knees, I got shorts on, I got the collar up, I got the hat, I got the Marilyn Monroe on. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very self-conscious. And I go in there, it looks like an episode of Baywatch. It's like all these gorgeous lifeguards everywhere. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I got my socks on and I'm going on the tube. And every time I pass like on the thing, the lifeguard's like, hey, um, your socks are on. Like, like they're helping me. I'm like, yeah, I already know that, okay? <laughs> And so I try to go down the slide and you're not really supposed to wear like thick cotton shirts, no lie. I go down the slide and it acts like a parachute and it catches the water and I get stuck 
halfway on the slide. So I'm having to like inch my way down. So just, just parting with bad stuff. And so like the next day we get in the car to go home and I'm just crabbing everyone. And um, all of a sudden we're driving on the highway and this uh, white bird is flying right next to us, like 55 miles an hour, okay? <laughs> 65, whatever we're going. And it's flying next to us. And all of a sudden it takes a right turn. You know how like all the pictures of doves, it's like the top view of a dove? All right, so we're going and all of a sudden this bird goes and it flashes, it's like, I'm a dove. Like, like it does like that thing. And then like right in front of our windshield and it keeps going. And I'm like, oh, stupid bird, you know. And, and um, Mary's like, oh my word, did you see that? And she's like, that, I think that was a dove. I'm like, Ugh. And she's like, doves don't fly in the freeway. And, that. and she's like, I think it means something. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, let's make this stop. And so, um, and so she's like, the kids are in the back. She's like, kids, just let's ask the Holy Spirit what it means. And uh, one of the kids uh, says, um, dad, I think it's God telling us that even though we're going through a tough time, he's still with us. I tell you what, as soon as he said that, something lifted. It was like God spoke through nature, something lifted, and it was like that whole thing left. I remember we went to a gas station. I'm like, I got to get my game back. I need to find somebody sick to pray for. So I remember I'm scanning it, then some guy comes by with a limp, pray for him, he gets healed. I was like, I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> what happened? God spoke through nature. God spoke through nature. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to uh, kind of go through some of these quickly. Dreams or parables at night. Dreams are parables at night. And so a lot, of pe- a lot of times people are like, oh, what did you eat last night? You must add some spicy pizza or something like that. Like in the Bible, they didn't like, hey, did you have some weird matzo balls or something? Like they, they didn't say that. Kings actually sought out people who could interpret dreams. Jesus would not be alive if they did not honor the dream that Joseph had about fleeing, uh, about fleeing from Egypt. Like dreams were honored. How many of you are dreamers? Okay. So um, how many are, uh, so my, my wife, I mean, literally every morning starts off with, did you have any dreams? Which is code word for, I had a big one and I want to tell you about it. <laughs> but let's hear about your stupid little dream first, right? <laughs> so she has what I call saga dreams. I'm like, there's no way you can remember that kind of detail. And so just when I feel like it's finally over, it's like, oh, and then episode two, we went into this room with these clowns. I'm like, what are you talking about, you know? Not really the clowns, but literally my dreams are like, yeah, I went to Walmart and there's a guy in a wheelchair and I prayed for him and he got out. And she's like, is that it? Like, that's all I got, right? So dreams, they're, they're the parables at night. Some people have the saga dreams, and, um, but we've had direction uh, for our church. We've had God speak to us about, warn us about wolves in the church. Our kids would have dreams, not knowing the interpretation. They would tell us about them and God showed us interpretation. And so if you want to have more dreams, let me give you a surefire way to do it. You guys Ready? Honor the dreams you're currently having by writing them down, okay? The shortest pencil's better than the longest memory, okay? So you got a light on your phone, you have a pen and paper by the bed, maybe you got to go into the bathroom so you don't wake up your spouse if you're married, but write those dreams down and it will open up the floodgates as you begin to honor that. If, you, if your dream life is shut off, just say, God, I'm sorry I haven't honored those things that way, or maybe he's speaking to you a different way, but if it's because you haven't honored it, just today, just, just in your heart right now, God, I want, I want you to speak to me in dreams again. And so, Lord, I, I'm going to honor these things. I'm going to pray that you're going to have dreams tonight. You guys good? We're almost done. Your physical senses, uh, Hebrews 5.14, but solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. You understand that your five senses can actually be uh, trained to discern good and evil. And so, um, so you can actually, um, your body can have words of knowledge about what's going on. Okay, so what we train our people to do is before you go into a room, check your body. You're not feeling anything. If you go into a room and you begin to feel angry, what are you doing? You're picking up what's already there and you can move in the opposite spirit. You carry the Holy Spirit. You have something greater in you than what's in the world and you can begin to carry it. Mary used to hate going to the mall because she's like, you know, do you feel that? I'm like, that's kind of drafty in here. I'm like, I, don't, I don't really feel anything. But they're like, oh, some people, they haven't learned how to, how to pick up those things, move in the opposite spirit, recognize that the guy's showing them those things so they can have authority over those things. I remember we, had, we did a training, a prophetic training at our church, and we were practicing, a, like, hey, let's just try, you know, it's a great place to practice, right? A church is a terrorist training camp to destroy the works of the devil, all right? And so we did this exercise, and um, I, I just practiced using a different sense. And so we kind of paired up, and this lady says, I smell oranges. And the way the lady she's partnered up with starts crying. She says, what's going on? The lady says, I was driving here uh, this morning, and I said, Lord, if you want me to go to this church, have somebody talk to me about oranges, 
So you can, you can discern your body, can, uh, you can sense confusion, anger, argumentative, all, all those type of things. What are you doing? Your body, you can actually begin to pick up these things and you've got authority to overcome those things. All right, let's, uh, let me give one warning, one story, then an activation. You guys good? Don't, um, one of the problems with hearing is that we, we can be heavily influenced by outward appearance. Okay, we can call suspicion, we can call it discernment when it's actually suspicion. So I remember we had this um, prophet came in town and he was talking about um, how he could smell different types of demons. And I'm telling you, like, you know, prophets are different cats, right? And so he was, he was talking about different, uh, different demon smells. And the only demon smell that I remembered was cat urine. For some reason, they just stuck out to me. I'm like, cat urine? Like, what is that? So um, fast forward like a, a little bit later, this girl comes in and uh, in the church, she doesn't have an appointment and she has to meet with me. And so I don't normally meet with women. So I got like my secretary, you know, I got the door open, got the secretary so she can see me. So this girl's in there and all I can smell is cat urine. I'm like, oh my word. Like, I don't normally smell it. This must be like a prince of demons for me to be able to discern this thing. So the whole time she's talking, I'm not thinking of anything. I'm just trying to make sure her juju doesn't get on me, right? <clears throat> so like in my spirit, I'm just fighting this thing. Like I'm not listening to anything she has to say. I'm just fighting this thing on the inside. Shut the bus, you know, just, and then, you know, all this stuff. Don't even hear a word she says. And so she gets off and I'm like, you're like, get, you know, get out of here. And I told her, I'm like, you would not believe this girl. She like reeked like cat. You don't even know what kind of demon this thing was, but I fought it. Like I did good, you know? And so, um, this is as a pastor, yeah. And so um, I'm going to pray for an impartation for you and you'll get nothing. Yeah, there we go. And so, um, so, the, uh, so, so like a day or two later, uh, oh, she left her umbrella in my office. And uh, a day or two later, she comes back and uh, she's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot my umbrella here and I have to apologize. She said, if you remember, I was telling you those stories of abuse and I was abused. I didn't hear anything. She's like, um, I was telling you those stories of abuse and I was abused so bad that I no longer have the, uh, this uh, this." Um, the sensation of smell. I can't smell anything. And I'd been leaving my umbrella out on the porch and our neighbor's cat had been coming and urinating on it. I had this girl, like, legionette. Like, she was the, like, the legion of demon, like the female version of it. And there was nothing demonic about it. It actually turned out she was great. She ended up being on our ministry team. If someone comes in dressed like a homeless person in the service, we might be more nervous thinking that they're apt to do something bad just because of outward appearance, not because the Holy Spirit is telling us these things, okay? So the warning is you can be heavily influenced by outward appearance. All right, so um, you know why the Holy Spirit is called the comforter? Because he's gonna have you go into situations where he's the only comfort. You're not gonna get your comfort from your circumstances. He's gonna make you uncomfortable. And as we're growing in these things, we have an opportunity to hear. So I'm going to close with the story and lead you in activation. So um, like I said, you may, you may not have just picked this up, but I'm not Mr. Like Outdoors. I'm not like Mr. Hunting. You know, I prefer filtered air through air conditioner than being outside. You know, my idea of roughing it is having a window facing the woods in the hotel, you know. <laughs> it's like, let's go camping. I'm like, yeah, let's pay a whole bunch of money to pretend we're homeless. That sounds amazing, right? And so... And so my parents sent me to wilderness camp in the sixth grade. It was, we lived in Kentucky, it was called Camp Webb, and so you're fishing, you're doing archery, and one of the things they do is they teach you how to do a shotgun. And so sixth grade, so we're there, and the shotgun instructor is giving all the instruction, and this may surprise you, um, I was goofing off with my friends and not listening. I know, it's weird, probably like, Jim, it's just so out of character. It was just, it was a dark season. And so, um, <clears throat> goofing off with my friends, I don't hear anything that he's saying. <laughs> and so all of a sudden he says, you, come up and show us how it's done. Sixth grade Jim Baker, um, you know, I don't know what I was, probably like five foot, 80 pounds, you know, I look like, you know, a little olive oil, you know, from uh, Popeye's girlfriend. <laughs> so I come up there and uh, I, didn't, hadn't, I didn't listen to anything he had to say. And so if you know anything about shotgun, it was a 12 gauge. So you got 20 gauge, 12, 16 gauge, 12. 12 gauge has got the most kick. You should not be giving an 80 pound boy, uh, you shouldn't be giving me an adult Jim a 12 gauge. <laughs> So, you know, you're supposed to put the gun on this shoulder so it's got some meat to kick to, okay? I, I didn't listen to this part. So I get the gun and I slap it under my arm. <laughs> I get the gun, pull! Shoo, track it out, shoot the gun. Obviously, it has a lot of kick. The gun goes shooting through my arms and scrapes and takes the flesh with it. And the concussion from it knocks me on my back. So now I'm there laying there bleeding, 
humiliated, my friends pointing and laughing at me. And I had this thought come to mind. I wish I'd paid attention. I wish I had paid attention. Right now you are sowing the seeds of your next breakthrough or your next disappointment. What does the Bible say? Pay attention to how you hear. Listen, guys, I really believe this is a year for us to increase our ability to recognize God's voice. He's already speaking, but I want us to be the people who pay attention and listen to it. Okay, so here's the activation we're going to do. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a way that people read the, uh, the Bible years ago called Lectio Divinae. It, it translates out to about divine readings. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read this passage of scripture, and I want you to just listen for one thing each time. That's all we're going to do. God's going to speak to you through scripture. You don't need to put the scripture up there. I just want people to listen to it. This will be Isaiah 54 from the message paraphrase. Okay, so before we start, you guys okay? Okay, so here's what we're going to do is I want you to just close your eyes and just still your spirit and just say, uh, let's pray that prayer that Samuel prayed. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So I'm going to give you 20 seconds to just kind of settle your spirit down and I'll give you instructions for the first reading. All right, in this first reading, I want you to just simply listen for the word or phrase that sticks out to you. Okay, just listen for the word or phrase that sticks out to you. So here we go. Sing, barren woman who has never had a baby. Fill the air with song, you who have never experienced childbirth. You're ending up with far more children than all those childbearing women. God says so. Clear lots of ground for your tents. Make your tents large, spread out, think big. Use plenty of rope, drive the tent pegs deep. You're going to need lots of elbow room for your growing family. You're going to take over whole nations. You're going to resettle abandoned cities. Don't be afraid, you're not going to be embarrassed. Don't hold back, you're not going to come up short. You'll forget all about the humiliations of your youth and the indignities of being a widow will fade from memory. For your maker is your bridegroom, his name, God of the angel armies. Your redeemer is the holy of Israel, known as the God of the whole earth. I want you to just take 20 seconds with the Lord and just talk to him about that word or phrase that connects to you. Just say like, Lord, I feel like this is what you're speaking to me. 20 seconds. All right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to one or two people next to you and just simply share that word or phrase no conversation about it, and then we're going to go back to our second reading. Okay, just somebody turn to somebody, share the word or phrase that stuck out to you, and then we'll uh, go back to our second reading. All right, 10 more seconds. All right, in the second reading, here's what I want you to do. I want you to listen for where in your life that word connects to you. So he gave you that word or phrase, where in your life does that connect to you? Okay, here's the second reading. You're listening for where that phrase connects to you. Sing, barren woman who has never had a baby. Fill the air with song, you who have never experienced childbirth. You're ending up with far more children than all those childbearing women. God says so. Clear lots of ground for your tents. Make your tents large, spread out, think big, use plenty of rope. Drive the tent pegs deep. 
you're going to need lots of elbow room for your growing family. You're going to take over whole nations. You're going to resettle abandoned cities. Don't be afraid. You're not going to be embarrassed. Don't hold back. You're not going to come up short. You'll forget all about the humiliations of your youth. And the indignities of being a widow will fade from memory. For your maker is your bridegroom, his name, God of the angel armies. Your redeemer is the holy of Israel, known as the God of the whole earth. Just take 20 seconds and talk to the Lord about where in your life that word or phrase connects with you right now. Here's what I want you to do. Just turn to the person next to you and just in one or two or three sentences, just share where that word or or phrase connects to your life right now. Just in two or three sentences, then we're going to do our final reading here. 60 seconds, go. All right, if you're talking to someone, switch. So you you give the two or three sentences here in the next 30 seconds. All right, five more seconds. Are you guys ready for the final reading? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to listen to God's call to action. What's God's call to action on this one? So we're going to read the same passage in in the same way, but I want you to listen to God's call to action. You guys ready? Sing, barren woman who has never had a baby. Fill the air with song, you who have never experienced childbirth. You're ending up with far more children than all those childbearing women. God says so. Clear lots of ground for your tents. Make your tents large, spread out, think big. Use plenty of rope, drive the tent pegs deep. You're going to need lots of elbow room for your growing family. You're going to take over whole nations. You're going to resettle abandoned cities. Don't be afraid. You're not going to be embarrassed. Don't hold back. You're not going to come up short. You'll forget all about the humiliations of your youth. And the indignities of being a widow will fade from memory. For your maker is your bridegroom, his name, God of the angel armies. Your redeemer is the holy of Israel, known as the God of the whole earth. I want you to take 60 seconds and talk to God about what he's calling you to do in this call to action.
All right, let's stand up for closing prayer. As you're standing, let me uh, read this verse over again. Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it'll be measured to you, and still more will be added. My comment was the value that you place in God speaking is the measure that you will hear. Lord, I just thank you that you're always speaking. We thank you for Jesus, who is the word of God. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for all the different ways you speak to us, all the ways I didn't even mention. And I pray that our hearts would be open to hear you more, Lord, that we would hunger for your voice. Lord, I know there's uh, people in here that they need a word from you, and we just thank you that you are willing to give it. You're not, uh, you're not withholding wisdom. It's available if we ask. So I bless your people to be the most dangerous people in their cities, to represent you well, to be like a leaf on a tree responding to your slightest breeze. I bless your people in the name of Jesus. Amen. Ministry teens will be coming forward. If you'd like some extra prayer, I know they would love to agree with you. And um, God bless you guys. So ministry teams are coming forward.